close out of this. Do you see my screen? Yes. Does it say SVG icons in Google Maps? It does. Okay, let's press present. Okay. So one of the reasons why, the way this happened was that Sean um, asked a question in the Slack channel, does anybody have anything? And I'm always, there's always some problem that I'm trying to solve. So I just wrote the problem that I'm trying to solve. And then an hour later, I solved it. So I said, you know what? This is another excuse. I could do a slideshow. I love doing slideshows. That's my favorite part. So anyway, um, this is the, the SVG icons in Google Maps. I had not worked with Google Maps before, but it turns out it's a lot of fun to try to switch or to play around with these um, icons. And, and you can't do as many things. It's, you don't have the full power of, or maybe you do, and I just don't know how, but it's a little more complicated than just doing it, you know, like in CSS and JavaScript, because it, as a, you know, if you've been in web development, you really can fine tune a lot of things and, and Google makes it a little harder. Okay, so let's see what we've got. So what's the problem? The problem was, is that, um, I wrote, oh, so the, the MTA, I work for the New York MTA and the maps already exist and they have these um, icons on them, but the icons do not match with the line. That's, that's the problem I'm gonna solve here. But there was actually another part of the problem where they had these estimated buses that need to be turned gray and squares, but um, we're not, that, that's not gonna be part of this talk. This is just like a simple kind of, how do I solve this coding problem? Okay, so let's see. So this is how they look now. Um, this is actually how they look now on the site. So you can see that the icons, if I go like this, can you see my, so see how they're like, um, they're circular and they have the picture of the bus and they have that white and they actually have these arrows. We have, that's actually on Monday, we have to work on the arrows, but um, so, what we need to do is get this icon to match with this red. See how the, there's red over here. That's the color of the line. I guess it's um, in Manhattan, they have red. What needs to change? So the, the bus icon should match the bus line and the estimated bus should be gray, but we're not gonna talk so that much about the what, um, gray. What of this right now is like custom to your site, the bus line completely and all the icons? Um, well, the little, um, the code also does these little stops. Okay. But there's some point where the little stops go up and the lines go up, but this is all like, I didn't do this. So this is my first time looking at this code. A lot of my work is somebody else did this code and something needs to get changed. But somebody in your, or like the organizations that like, this is. Well, it was form. some other organization that they, they hired these people on the outside and they charged way too much money yeah. and we don't even know who they are. And it, it's very uh, mysterious. Yeah, it's I was just trying fun. to get an idea of what is like Google Maps itself and what is what you Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah so yeah, everything yeah. underneath this, so like Garment District, yeah. um, I, I think all the, this, these, these stations, the blue is probably part yeah. of Google Maps. Yeah, yeah. So we have these icons, which aren't that pretty. And we have the, the red line, it's called polylines in the code. Mm -hmm. And there's something called, stop um, that makes these blue ones because I would sometimes if I change the wrong part of the code, I end up with way too many icons. Okay, let's see what's next. Okay, so here was one possible way to solve uh, the problem. So it, it was um, here, maybe I can show you the code. This is, um, this is how it looks on, you know, the Google documentation. So I could do things like fill color, stroke weight. And I was like, great, look, I could do it. I can change it right here. Look at that. The only problem is, is that there's only one path. See? And, you know, uh, so we, we <laughs> that I was like, oh no, we only have one path. So let's go back to this. So that was one, one option was to make this one path. And then we had, you can change the fill color and the stroke color. I'll go back to that present business. Okay, so let's see. But that code only has one path. That's what I wrote big. Okay, so what happens when I, so then I had, I only had part of a bus. I only had part of a bus and, you know, we had to figure out where to put the, the fill in the stroke, but that will, that part we'll figure out. We're getting closer to that one. So that was one of my, because I'm working with a designer. So we kind of go back and forth. Okay, 
So that was how it looked. And the problem is, is that it only shows that one path. And it, that looks pretty funny. And it, I think he sent me another one that had like four paths in it. And I was like, oh, I got to find some more, some different code. So then I came up with this. This was another try. And this is like the whole thing with all those, you know, here's more than one path. It's all, but it's all like in there in this, um, this whole, uh, what do you call that in, in JavaScript? Um, like an object, this giant object. And I, I think I couldn't get this JavaScript to work properly in that way. So then, so that was the, the, the color didn't load, you know. So this is the way that actually worked. What the way that actually worked is you have, you do it outside of this part, which is the object, I guess. And, um, it was the next um, slide shows the complete code, but you can put the line color in with the plus signs, kind of the JavaScript um, concatenation, I believe that's called. And that actually works. And it was just very, you know, like the whole process is like, how can I do this? Can I try that? Can I try that? And it's just very exciting when it works and it actually shows up on the screen. So that that's the whole long code of how it works. But Again, I'm only doing the line color. The other one, I, I could do the stroke color also. So I guess there are other things in here, but I figured out I could change the fill and line color and that actually did work. Oh, this was just a painting I did this morning and I wanted to throw it in. So that just kind of came up there. See, this is why I like doing slideshows. You get to throw in fun things. Okay, so then, so anyway, the bus with that other code, the bus finally worked and it, you know, the green bus icon matches the, line and you know we still have to work on the, the rounding and you know it actually got further than this but this was the end of this was solving that particular piece so i was kind of excited about seeing this is with the red line and it matches so that's it and there, there's the um all these links so you can learn more so that is my whole talk wow i loved it <laughs> i love i love i love seeing how people like you know, attack a problem and then solve it. Um, yeah. And I so, like that you did that painting this morning by yourself. Like that was it. That's you, you know, how, so it's funny. I, I, I do these a lot. So okay. um, somebody <laughs> asked me, how long did it take you? And I said, well, you know, it's like an hour chopped up into like five or 15 minute increments or whatever. But I say, actually, I started when I was five years old. So <laughs> very nice painting. <laughs> Cause you know, like you just, after a while, you just kind of get used to doing artwork. For a number of years, I barely did any artwork because I was so busy learning coding. So I was, don't do that. I thought for a second you were going <laughs> to say- Doing the like things this. that you really enjoy in life, but sometimes it's hard. I thought for a second you were going to say that you were going to show us the code for that painting, but it was a oh, no. SVG. No. <laughs> it's just, just one div. <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's really yeah. one div and one one machine learning of a human mm, well cool so yeah i i like the i like the whole you know i i i, I enjoy the fact that google's documentation doesn't just fail me constantly because i feel like their example code is never as good as i want it to be mm -hmm. uh, in most of the things that i look at uh, yeah, what actually solved it was probably the the, the bottom two links are, are um, I think they're probably Stack Overflow. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. find somebody who asks the question that you want, and 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 you you copy the code and you try yep. it, and sometimes they have typos in it or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes it actually is the right answer. I'm yep. assuming that another cool benefit of how you solve the problem by having the SVG is that now. You know, so your designer can design this thing and, and export it as SVG, and then you just pop that, you know, code in, and you don't have to try to recreate the the art for that, you know, in Google mm -hmm. in the Google Maps itself. Yeah, I mean, you can use PNGs also, and you know, just the SVG yeah. does a nice sizing part. So now, why did you have multiple paths just to draw that thing? Just the multiple. Draw the Oh, yeah, so, um, right, like the, the color of the line comes from code. I mean, it comes from an API. So, I mean- But you had different I could go on the there. site and show you like the APIs and digging into to all that, but- Were the different paths just to make that one icon or were the different paths conditionally changing which icon showed? 
It was just to make so, that one box. Um, right. So it turns out I probably can use the same icon for most of it, but this mm -hmm. estimated is going to be gray. Right. So like I can use CSS to make the gray. There's a line map. Mm -hmm. If you want to share, I can actually show you. Let me just put this. I'll go back to share again. And somebody wrote something. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, so this is actually um, how it looks. See, this is the icon. We, we, mm -hmm. He did it in reverse. It's reversed. And whatever, he has to fix it. So, so the, yep. the, it's supposed to show the other way, but you can see the green is showing up. But then mm -hmm. these are the, est so right, the estimated icons look like this. So they have squares. Okay. So that's kind of new. And then you click on this and you get a different map. And I was working on these badges so that we get the arrival times to show up properly because they weren't showing up. So, oh, and this is a legend. This is another Google Google Maps thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. So after that, I, right? They both have the same icon right now because we haven't done the other one yet. <laughs> well, hey, you'll get there. We'll get there, right? It's piece by piece. So, Good anyway, it was a fun project, and it was fun to finally show something that I actually do um, at, at my job. Because every now and then they give me things that I like as opposed to today where things weren't working at all. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> well, thank you, Leora. We appreciate that. Anybody have any questions about any of that before we switch over on to the next? All right. So I'm going to just talk and show do is show and tell. Uh, hold on a second, let me pull up some code. So I'm gonna give you a quick background. So I uh, do a lot of client work because that's all I do. And uh, it's Drupal 8 site and we were using web forms. Um, and a request came sometime in August, I wanna say, uh, to basically create a form on the site that would kind of start like a approval process for a user. Um, not like the Drupal, normal Drupal user kind of form. Um, and so it basically, um, you know, somebody who's a teacher wants to get, you know, instructor resources. So like, you know, maybe slideshows, images, test bank questions, right? But these, these people need to be vetted before they get access to the specific thing. Um, and so my first thought was, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll just create this role and this role will have permission to access these specific types of resources. And they said, no, we want them to be specific to the specific piece of content. So that got made a little more complicated. But um, needless to say, uh, we're using Webform to capture that data, to send off a whole bunch of emails, uh, and two of the things that I have in this, um, two of the things that I have essentially had to build from scratch for this, very small, but you know, they're super helpful to kind of make this whole thing work, uh, are two custom web form handlers. Um, and so one creates an account, well, checks to see if a user has an account and creates an account. Um, and then the other one, gives them the role and make sure that they have the access to that specific node ID. So there's like a whole node access kind of thing going on. Um, let's find this piece of code I want to pull up. Uh, So there's two custom handlers. Uh, hey, Sean, um, yeah. can you share your screen? I am. I'm just trying to close out all the other garbage that you don't need to see. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, oh, VS Code. <laughs> yeah, you know, here's my S3 key. Uh, uh, here we go. All right, let me move it down here so it's smaller. Um, oh, where's the share button? This, this also may be for your eyes only and not on the YouTubes. I get worried about sharing real code on YouTube. 
Uh, that's not one. Uh, sure. Okay. Cool. All right. So I've got I've got two things uh, going on here, right? Uh, so my first custom handler uh, gets fired off when the um, user or the person fills out the form, right? So when the person fills out a form, uh, right now probably like. 99 to 100% of the time, they are going to be logged out of the site because this is like brand new functionality. Um, and so when they submit this form, they basically will get a user account set up for them with this role, uh, but basically don't have full access to the site. Um, and so basically we're using this, uh, we're extending this web form handler uh, base. Uh, so again, you know, just to Lioris, think, you know, you Google around enough, you can find some good examples and then extend them from there. Uh, that was very much uh, this read about four or five blog posts to make this thing work. So um, basically we get the web form data. We check to see if this email has an account on the site. Uh, if we don't get a user ID back, we create a user, we set all the information, their password, their name, set their role. Uh, and this one we are activating it here. Uh, we went back and forth about whether we should activate the user or not um, in this step or the next one. Uh, and then basically, otherwise, we're going to load that user and make sure that they have this role, right? Because this is very important because only this role can get referenced by that other piece of content uh, where the you know private files are stored. So real simple, you know, 60, not even 60 lines of code. And I get this nice little bit of functionality that basically provisions this thing without a uh, person having to really get involved. Um, and then the second part of it is when, um, when the person, the actual person who's doing the vetting uh, does their job, there's a uh, admin only field on the web form um, that they can set to either approved or rejected. And then if it's approved, then it does this other custom handler. If it's rejected, it just kind of sends them a, a nice little note about what they can do. Um, so, um, same thing. We have uh, another handler here. Um, we get our web form data. So basically, when that person is updating this node, uh, this is what's going to happen. So this post save is just firing off after they hit the save button. After they update it, uh, we check to see what the user is. Um, we make sure that there's a value value for this request source thing. Um, so there's a hidden field about where the request was made from, like what thing they're trying to get access to. Uh, so we just want to double check that the you know form ballot, the form was a valid piece of information, so we don't like end up throwing errors uh, when we try to set this. So uh, if it is numeric and we get a, a source back, then we can load that node, and then basically we're going to add this person, this user, uh, to the list of um, reference instructors who have access to this. And then we just save that node, the node updates, and you know that instructor gets an email that says, hey, go log in or go to this page and you can now download these links. And so this whole process essentially goes from a bunch of buttons that say to go to the form to request access, to request access for this specific content. And then once they have access and are referenced by the piece of content, they get um, kind of uh, S3 magic links. Uh, so they're like expiring links that only exist for, you know, 15 minutes or something. Um, so they can't share these resources, you know, on Twitter and have people actually download them. Um, you know, not that vetted people are gonna do that, but just in case we, we added an extra check in there just to not have these links like kind of always persist um, in the site. So that's pretty straightforward. You know, didn't take long uh, to do like, uh, you know, your said, you know, it took her about an hour to solve her problem. Mine probably took me about two just to get it all wired up, tested and run it through. But, you know, pretty straightforward once, you know, you found something to kind of go off um, and, um, you know, for a request that came in in August and basically had to be done by the middle of September or so, you know, it was pretty straightforward to do this part, get it all wired up, actually hooks up to HubSpot too. So there's a whole nother complexity piece here that, you know, dumps that data into their CRM. Um, but that, you know, was, again, there's a module for that, uh, kind of thing. So, uh, we just tied the, the, hub, the web form and the HubSpot, uh, form together. So, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of moving parts, but essentially like create this nice workflow, 
this is like phase one of probably two or three phases on this um, to build out some more functionality around this stuff. But, you know, nice, easy wins um, without too much work um, to get something like this done. How did you validate the user? I missed something. Like, how do you know who really the person is? Oh, it's like a real person checking. Right, so um, there's there, there's no computer involved in that. Basically, the the person at the client, or more than one person at the client, will review to make sure, like, okay, are you are you the professor teaching this course that you say you're teaching that you want this book for? Um, did you use a university email address? Right? Did you provide me the information that you know I can say yes, you are the person you say you are, uh, and you're not faking, you know, faking to be somebody. So there's like, uh, you know, a human checking, you know, the data that's entered into this form. And previously, they used to just mail this stuff or email it, right? So basically, the old way was somebody filled out a form, they vetted that person. If they vetted that person, then they sent them a bunch of email links. So there's actually no protection on those links, right? So if they actually did send it to somebody, right, and they got the link, well, I have the resource now, I could spread it on the internet, right? Um, not to, to say once they download these files, it's not the same thing, but at least it adds a little bit uh, more automation into the process. Uh, and doesn't just have like raw files sitting in somebody's email account um, for forever. As we know, our Gmail accounts just keep growing and growing and growing. Um, a, a question for later. Um, okay. What's the story with Rockowitz? Uh, read his blog. <laughs> I, I've been, I've been getting oh, it. That's so, I just wondered if there That's was, uh, oh, maybe what, uh, Ted had some comment on it, uh, oh. uh, you know, because he's been, uh, fired up about, um, well, if you've been reading it, you know, and I just wondered well, what, the, what the, uh, the long term was with him bailing on the, uh, web form. So he didn't bail on it. Uh, last, no, post I, last post I read, which was like last month, maybe, was that uh, he works for Memorial Sloan Kettering. And oh, really? I missed that. Yeah, that's who he works for. Uh, okay. And they were abandoning Drupal for Sitecore, I think is what they were doing, um, if blog posts served me correctly. Um, and so he was like, you know, basically over the past year or so, he's been writing these blog posts of like, well, if Drupal is not my job, do I continue to do this and yes, stuff like right, that? Right. Um, and essentially, you know, the last blog post was like, hooray, they decided to not go to Sitecore because it was such a pain in the butt. And actually, they're going to go more Drupal uh, was kind of the, the synopsis of that. So he's staying in the community. And I would assume he's still going to maintain the web four module, but maybe not as aggressively as he had been doing. No, it's, I, 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 I missed the blog because I'm not really seeing the blog. I'm just seeing uh, occasional um, posts come flying through my phone uh, because <laughs> of my Drupal interest. But it's funny because I used to work for uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering also oh, yeah. years, many years ago. I, with when they were actually producing one of their very first websites, <laughs> which was hard coded. Of course. Content doesn't need to change. I did not know. That, yeah, I didn't know that uh, um, that his organization, Sloan Kettering, had switched back. I knew that they. I didn't know what they were switching to, but I remember the blog post where he's saying, "Well, I'm not." I don't think they ever made the switch. I think they all, we're oh. all we're are, we're in the process of getting the switch done, and then it was just such a a nightmare. And I I'm assuming the person who pushed for that switch maybe shifted roles or you know exited or something because. There seemed to be a substantial backtrack, um, yeah, because it didn't seem vetted, right? Like, I think yeah. you know they got sold on the idea of a product, and then the reality of the product wasn't what they thought it was, or something of that nature. Um, and you know, that getting happens. all these getting all these developers ramped up on yet another technology was a lot more cumbersome than they had anticipated. I think. That's what you get when you get managers making decisions for uh, the team. Well, senior managers, like uh, VP type people. Yeah. Who, uh, here, here are some great uh, news or uh, get sold a story. Yeah, I've been through that. 
Uh, so I think that's the story. Uh, you know, we could have him on. He could, you know, talk more about it. But I think I think that's the moral of the story is, you know, open source wins. Um, again. <laughs> Uh, did anybody have any questions that they wanted to ask? Otherwise, maybe I'll ask Ted to give like five second, five second, five minute. What's what's happened since it's the last time you spoke here? I actually have to go get dinner. The five seconds. Uh, yeah, give me five seconds. It is, is that it, it works? No, but the dev version <laughs> works. It does update your site via Composer, and. Um, there is instructions in the README for the for the 2.x version of the module, which I'll link to in a second, for how to test it. Like if you wanted to test it like on a completely new project versus like um, starting adding it to one of your projects. But anyways, we're looking for testers. Um, so there's manual instructions, but you also should be able to um, add it to your if you use the composer require command in those instructions, you should be able to add it to any Drupal 9 project, but um, I'm sure there's a lot of cases we haven't thought of. So right now we're just sort of like, if, if your composer JSON is how we think it should be, it might work, but. I'll play with it. All right, All right. No, I gotta go. No, 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 no. Stay, stay. Apparently I'm not called to dinner. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for the update. <laughs> there's a video in the Dries note, which I think is available to watch, maybe. Yeah, I think they're there, yeah. Um, so you can skip to, I, I can't tell you the exact minutes uh, where my video is. No, it might be on his part. blog. He had chunked up the blog, I think. His blog oh, yeah, the video is on, on his blog, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's like, it's available for testing. We're trying to figure out, like, uh, you know, a lot of like edge cases, like how should we handle distributions, yeah. um, stuff like that. And trying to like figure out like what is MVP as far as functionality. Um, we hope to get an alpha version of the contrib module out soon, and then a patch or a merge request for core soonish also. So um, yeah. It, uh, Exciting it's stuff. Yeah, it doesn't actually do the really advanced uh, package signing stuff because Drupal.org has to do that part first. So that would be something we would plug in later once Drupal.org implements it. So, so would yeah. that not be in core until that happens, or um, probably not? Um, it it would be in core, but in alpha. But then like they rip out they rip out alpha modules. But then um, so it'd be in the Git checkout, but not in the release. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I'm going to advocate for that if it, if it takes a long time for Drupal.org to implement it, that we should still include it if it's through like a form where you click it. Because there's like two different things that will offer like during cron and mm -hmm. then during just you see a form and you say update to this version. Um, so to me, like updating via form is not much different than updating via the command line as far as. Right. Um, we already offer updating via form. Uh, I think the cron thing is really is really important to be as secure as we can because the first security release that comes out once a bunch of sites are using this, mm -hmm. it's obviously a big attack vector if we got yeah. it wrong. Um, For sure. But if people are updating like individually, it's not as big a deal. But yeah, we'll see. I don't. I haven't really like written up my reason for that reasoning yet, but. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You can update it. If you install the project, you can update via like a form or you can set it on Chrome. But you always have to make sure that you're like not up to date. Obviously, you have. So that's why the manual instructions are like get the mm -hmm. second to last Drupal version. So, so you can also yeah. wait around for an update to come out to test the module. Gotcha. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Cool. Good to see everybody. Enjoy play. your dinner. Nice. Pizza? P pizza for dinner? Is that what it is? Uh, no, it's some sort of like chicken pot pie. <laughs> Do you fold your pot pie? <laughs> there you go. It's in a bowl. It you got like, it. It doesn't look like a pot pie anymore. It's a bowl, but okay. I'm sure it'll be good. <laughs> See y'all later. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. All right. We didn't get Kevin. 
Kevin didn't. Kevin didn't say. Kevin, do you fold your pizza? No, I do not fold my pizza. And if you couldn't guess where Kevin works, it's behind his head. <laughs> Thanks for calling us. Is, in the is this politically incorrect or? No, you're fine. You could put up a sign for uh, whatever your uh, company name is. I could. I, I just choose to blur my messy office out. <laughs> your office looks pretty skinny. It looks like it could have been a closet. No, it's it's a very small bedroom. Okay. I feel yeah. like you'd almost reach out and touch his wallet. Uh, pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> at least where I am right now. So I got a trivia question for Kevin. For me? Yes, of course, because J&J. So what's the J&J uh, &J company policy on vaccines? On vaccines? Yeah. Um, we are, everybody is encouraged to be vaccinated. Those, and they told us they wanted us mostly all vaccinated by the 4th or 10th of October because we are theoretically back in the building, um, back in the office and we can, but they, as a concession to the people that have been out in the field for a long time, but, and also a concession to the people that can't leave, um, they want us in the office three days a week. And the other two, they're calling flex, flex days or something. But one of those flex days is you choose to do two has to be Friday. So don't expect a lot of work getting done on Friday is my gut feel. <laughs> Bottom line, people are rolling in. Um, I've heard mixed messages on the J&J &J vaccination with doing the booster shot. I've yep. heard internal discussions that did not match what I saw on a blog post or something via Google, which was like, seems like it's a good idea to, to double that up. Um, but I, but there's, um, there's, I have information from inside from a vice president, which I won't repeat because you're recording this message, but 